righty. Well, hello and welcome everybody to So a Neighbor Asked. This is our monthly series from Mountain States Legal Foundation, where our attorneys answer your questions to help you understand more about the Constitution, the law, and the principles of liberty. I am your host, Stanton Skirjanek, the Communications Manager here at Mountain States. Uh, before we begin, I want to tell you a little about ourselves. Uh, Mountain States is a non profit public interest law firm dedicated to restoring those rights enshrined in the Constitution at zero legal cost to our clients. Uh, we are focused on protecting property rights, economic liberty, the right to keep and bear arms, free speech and association, and equality under the law. Uh, from our headquarters in beautiful Colorado, we litigate crucial cases at every level all the way up to, uh, to the Supreme Court, and especially those that make a difference in our country. Today, our question is, so a neighbor asked, what is bureaucratic review? There are countless of cases that Mountain States has taken up in its 45 years that have a resembling terrifying story. Some government agency decides they want to review some tiny little detail about uh, a potential decision. It might be uh, a gas and oil lease. Maybe you purchased one from the federal government, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, and thought, you could start drilling, and then the Bureau decides they're going to take a different look. In reality, those bureaucrats, motivated by some agenda or another, uh, decide to place your lease on hold indefinitely while they review whether or not they made the right call. You take them to court, only for them to change the smallest thing over time, all the time, so that the legal battle inches at a glacial pace, uh, to the point that you just give up. We're going to find out if that's really the story or if I'm just being a conservative conspiracy nut. I'm joined today by Mountain States Legal Foundation attorney David McDonald, and joined with him is uh, the Assistant Solicitor General for the state of Montana, Katie smith -Gull. And I'm also going to let David introduce a very, very special guest indeed. So thank you for that introduction, Stanton. Uh, yeah, like I, like you said, I'm David McDonald, attorney here at Mountain States Lego Foundation. And it's my honor to introduce to you all Kelly Longwell, our, our client in a long-running, uh, sadly long-running case, Mountain States Lego Foundation. Uh, recently got some, some uh, long-weighted uh, success in. Uh, Kelly Longwell is the daughter of Sidney Longwell, who, who originally purchased the, his oil and gas lease from the federal government back in 1982. Um, and has still not had the opportunity to to start drilling. So yeah, so I just uh, want to welcome welcome Kelly. Uh, have you introduce yourself? And then uh, I'm also very curious because I I met your dad once or twice. I spoke to him on the phone a couple times, but I never really got to know him. So I'd be really curious if you could tell us a little bit about about him as well. Well, uh, dad um, was a banker for 25 years, then went out on his own. Um, bought a small business, um, then retired from that and ended up uh, being a public servant for about another 20 years. Uh, like you said, he he um, paid for the lease back in 1982, worked uh, to get the uh, get it, the lease assigned to a, a oil company and got the approval to drill the APD. And then all of a sudden, people started coming out of the woodworks um, from the bureaucrats just trying to delay, delay, delay. And um, it was a lifelong mission of his to, to see something happen under this lease. So I really feel like I am fulfilling his dream of continuing to push. I mean, we really did not get any traction at all until we got Mountain States involved in um, 2013. So it, it's uh, been a long road. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, long road indeed. Um, and I'm, I'm excited that we get to talk about this and, and give it some more public light. Um, for our viewers who are online, after we chat here for about a half hour or so, we're going to have a kind of a question and answer session uh, to close out the episode. If you are joining us here on Zoom, you can find a kind of a Q&A button at the bottom of your portal uh, where you can ask your questions. If you are on Facebook, I've got you on a screen over here. Uh, we're going to try our best to grab your questions from uh, Facebook Live in the comments. So feel free to ask your questions. I may not get to all of them, but we would love to see uh, see all the questions you've got. So let's get to it. Everybody, help me out here. How close was I in my introduction? Did I 
explain this bureaucratic review thing accurately? Am I just making this up? Am I crazy? What what's what's the reality here? Yeah, so I think this is the 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 great hidden reality. I think it, the it's like the iceberg of the United States government is the the little tip above the water is the the president, Congress, the 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 half dozen people whose name you actually remember when you see on the news and all that. Um, but something that a lot of people are surprised by, and I didn't really respect or understand this until I started doing this for a living is that like 90 plus percent of the stuff that you're interacting with on a daily basis, the, the rules that interact with you in your life, like that never crossed the legislator's desk. Um, almost all of it is part of this, of, of what I guess the, the, the popular conscious would refer to as the deep state or the administrative state. That's the, the professional bureaucrats um, in, the, in the federal agencies. And it really is the situation, as, as I'm sure anyone who's ever attempted to, to build a, a, a back porch on their house is probably aware, or anyone who's had the, the misfortune of having a, a kid try to open a lemonade stand in California will know uh, that you really, you need to go asking for permission before you can do anything. And usually you have to ask permission multiple times throughout that process. And yeah, I think that's, that's sadly just a, a fact of life for, for many of us. Yeah. So th- this, this whole thing about you know, the deep state, okay. This, this idea that there, there's someone who's reviewing, giving you permission to do what you want, want do what you want with your property. Uh, Katie, this, this deep state thing, does Montana have to deal with this or this is just a federal uh, uh, government level issue? Well, I'd say certainly, you know, any sort of entity uh, like a government structure, you're going to experience that. Um, you know, we we see it obviously, um, you know, within state agencies. Just um, you know, the kind of the num the level of review that has to happen before the state can take action. Uh, but then we also see it and experience it exactly what David's describing, looking at the federal government and and watching just how the the these bureaucrats can slow roll these uh, these approval processes, whatever it's, David made a comment about, you know, asking for permission. And, you know, I sometimes joke with my friends, oh, you know, ask for forgiveness rather than permission. But no, the federal government, they want you to ask for permission, ask for permission again, say it a little bit clearer, a little bit different. And you just are, you, sound, you kind of sound like a broken record over and over again, trying to accomplish something. And so um, certainly it's it's also frustrating from this, from the state's perspective. And um, you know, kind of building off of, of what David said, just this idea that this process can drag out for so long. Oh, looks like we might have uh, lost Katie there a little bit. I mean, a part of, I think, what what we are trying to do and certainly other states and, and individual groups is is try to, you know, cut that process down, make it easier for people to get permission to do what they want to do, to build the back porch, to um, drill for oil and, and, and those types of types of things. So I certainly agree with, with what's been said. Okay. You're hundred percent right with us. They gave us the permission and then kept ordering report after report to second guess their decision. And when the report came back, not saying what the bureaucrat wanted it to say, they ordered another one. I think in the, in the end, there were like 13 different reports that were ordered. So. Yeah, if I recall correctly, I think in your case, it was you received final approval on your, your application for permit to drill on, on four separate occasions, I believe it was. Actually, right. you know what, Kelly, could you actually go through the uh, the story that, that your dad and you have all gone through? I know this this has been going on since at least the 80s for y'all. Can you can you go right. through that a little bit for sure. us? I'm going to use my notes so I get the dates correct. Absolutely. Well, it, it, you got to have notes for something as crazy as this. Well, it's, it's unbelievable. In 1982, Dad um, bought the lease from uh, the Department of Interior, uh, from BLM, Bureau of Land Management. He, In 1983, he entered into an agreement to drill. Um, in 80, later that year, the application to drill was filed. 85, uh, 1985, it was approved, um, but it was appealed by um, to the Interior Board of Land Appeals. Uh, 1987, we finally got our finding of no significant impact. So that's sort of the trigger that says you can go forward with what you're asking for. Um, then in 1981, um, 
they uh, BLM did gave us another decision saying we're approved to drill. Uh, in 1993, we got our fourth decision saying it's okay to drill. Um, then in 1993, uh, Secretary Babbitt suspended the lease. Just said put, every, put excuse me suspended the permit. So, so after four approvals, they after just four suspended approvals. it again. And for going through the review process. I mean, this is not just, it, it, it would be remanded back to BLM. And BLM said, you're okay. There's um, two environmental impact studies in at this point. Yes. By 93. Um, then again, in 97, excuse me, 96, there was the another, the one-year suspension was extended. Um, in December of 90, 97, they, uh, the keeper of the National Register, they brought in another government agency to go back and, and review everything. Um, so in 1998, we lost our, our oil company that was going to drill because it had been 20 years. So they gave the lease back to us or they signed it back to us. And um, then after, in 2002, after five years of review, basically, um, they moved what was the historic district for the tribe over to our space. So this now, is 30 years or 20 years after the original. So, so just, so just when I'm hearing this, right, they're, they're adding another agency. So we get the classic joke, how many bureaucrats does it take to screw in a light bulb? Apparently way too many and they still don't screw it in. Um, but on top of that, what, what, what is, what, what, what was motivating these, these constant reviews and decisions? Like, were these bureaucrats out for you? Was there someone else motivated them to do this? What's what's the background here? There there were several. So we would go to hearings. We we went to Great Falls, I think, on three different occasions to have hearings with with all the interested parties, which would include environmentalists, which would include the tribes, which would include um, bureaucrats, some some people from the National Park Service that do the historic part of this new review. Hmm. And basically, they are under the law. They're required. Uh, they're required to give us what the impact is. What are we doing to impact their their issue? What is their issue? And then we get to respond, saying, "Here's how we'll mitigate our our issue or your issue. Here's here's what we will do." And lo and behold, they would never give us an answer. So this is so, more than just saying how you're. Uh, how your lease is going to impact, you know, some species of, of rodent on the on on the land. It's also how it's affecting any interested party under the sun. It just and anyone they, would just they, clamor in. Uh, hundreds and thousands of acres that would that were now sacred to the tribe twenty years after we originally got the lease. Man, so it was it was quite frustrating. All, I mean, all we ever wanted was hear the hear the rules. Let's play by the rules. Mm -hmm. And we played by them over and over and over and over again. And just the, the goal line kept moving. Yeah, it's fascinating because you can, you can actually watch if you go through the, the records from this case, you can see how the, the various, the cultural inventories is what they're, they're often referred to as, is you can see how the claims about the, the property have changed since the, the, the mid 80s when they first started doing this throughout the, the mid nineties. And you can see it's very much, they went in, or in the eighties and nineties said, Hey, is there anything here we need, need to know about? We need to be aware just to make sure that there, there's no historical problems here. Tribe said, no, that's, there's, there's nothing out there. Um, we, we don't have any, any particular claim to, to any objects or, or areas in, the, in that where you're going to be drilling. Um, and you can very much see over the course of the, of the years where the activist kind of turns the camera off. It's like, okay, no, grandma, we, you need to remember, right, when you were little and we did this thing here. So like, you can very much see the, the, the creation of, of this narrative over time. Like it didn't exist when they started, um, but because of the delay, they were able to all this kind of post hoc insert all this, these arguments in that didn't exist at the time. Right. And okay. we're not far from an interstate and a rail, a rail line. I mean, it's, it, there are other government properties that are there that provide much more impact on a daily basis than what we were proposing. And a pipeline, actually, that runs right. along the, there's already an oil pipeline. Yeah. So, so it, it's, you know, uh, 
there, so people can make the argument though that we need some sort of review process to make sure that we're good. Like you know, we do this you know in our cities where if someone wants to lay down uh, uh, some you know fiber cable for internet, they got to make sure that hey, you're not a, you're not going to cut through our utilities, and you know, we got to make sure everything's kosher. So it's not like this is an unreasonable request to do a review, but this is more than just review. This is this is moving the goalpost every time you hit their their requirements. They add on something else. Right. And, and we had already met them four times. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, it, you know, Katie, David, Kelly, is this something that has, is this something unique to, to the Longwell's uh, 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 circumstance? Or is this something that agencies, state or federal have been doing for a long time? Is this recent? Is this new? Like it, this, this can't possibly be a normal theme, right? Uh, more, more normal than I think we would like to believe it is. Uh, and I don't, and I don't know, I haven't done the, the proper research to, to come up with a good answer on this, but from my experience, we're based off of the Solonex case, other cases of this sort of weaponized delay that we've seen, um, stories that I've heard, it really seems like there was a massive sea change in the early nineties. And right around 92, 93 is the year I always get. Um, Bruce Babbitt's name comes up a lot. Um, that was that was kind of the, the major sea change in how this was done, where it went from the original purpose of the of uh, the agencies and the environmental review process of this sort of multi-use, how do we get the, the, the best use for the most people out of the, the land that we all share, um, and towards a more kind of activist, environmentalist approach. And it seems to be kind of that in the early 90s. And since then, it's been pretty much universal in my experience. Um, you get you get on the ground. There are a lot of really, really great BLM employees, Forest Service employees, stuff on the ground. But once you get up to a certain level, this, this in my experience, has been fairly universal. Yeah, we're not talking about your, your park ranger. We're talking about some <laughs> see who's making this decision. Uh, so, OK, so we, we know that at least at a federal level, this is happening. Katie, is this happening in Montana? Yeah, well, and, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I'll offer the perspective from the Montana as a state, um, you know, facing the federal government and and trying to, you know, push back on on this idea that the government can just kind of indefinitely delay these these um, uh, processes. And I, I think, Kelly, the near, uh, the picture that she painted of moving the goal co- post is, is, is very accurate. And and that the more you know, we we are able to wep- these, these environmental and these activist groups are able to weaponize this process. The goalpost keeps moving. That of course creates uncertainty for um, businesses, states, those who are trying to follow the rules and comply. And of course, the government is never going to move the goalpost back. They're not going to say, you know what, we have a little bit too much power, we have a little bit too much authority over this process, and we're going to go ahead and and, and step back. No, once they once they kind of have the go ahead that they can continue to kind of jerk people around and and you know um, do this excessive uh, review of of these projects, they're going to continue doing so. And so um, that, of course, as a state, creates a lot of um, concern because that's the federal government taking power that should otherwise be reserved for the states, and that should you know the states. It's kind of our job to be be pushing back on that a little bit. But then from just a a citizen of the, of the of the state of Montana of the United States, I I I worry just about kind of the uncertainty that this just injects into the economy, into all these reliance interests that are um, that businesses, individuals, um, different organizations have when they're when they're again just trying to follow the rules. But how do you follow the rules when they're constantly changing? Actually, David, you want to describe what happened when Mountain State started to make progress at the federal level. Um, you want to tell them about what the Secretary of the Interior, Interior did? Yeah, so th- this is the part that really gets gets my goat. So Mountain States gets involved, like Kelly said, in 2013. Um, we're able to get a federal judge to to take a look at it, and he says, okay, this is this is ridiculous. It's been over 20 years. You need to give these people an answer on, on the suspension of their lease. Is it going to remain suspended, or is it not? Well, yes or no? And they say, okay, the Give us 120 days. We'll come back and we'll do it. They come back and they say, you know what? Actually, your honor, funny thing. We were looking through our old paperwork and actually 
BLM may have screwed up a little bit back in 1982. Um, their, their, their National Environmental Policy Act, the NEPA, their, their NEPA analysis wasn't quite as robust as we think was necessary. So uh, your, your lease is null and void and canceled. You don't have anything. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I forgot to add that tidbit. Sorry. Yeah. Canceled? Like canceled. Yeah. For, brought up for the first, well, yeah, brought up by the by the federal government for the first time in response um, to our to our motion to get some to get some motion on over a motion to get later. some motion. Yeah, uh, on the case. It, it, so the fir- brought up for the first time in 2015, I believe. Um, OK, hold on, hold on. Ba- back up. I'm sorry. They canceled it after you no know, this 30 year hiatus of suspending you, putting you in this bureaucratic pur- uh, purgatory. What the hell is. Nipa, what what did you just what, what, explain this to me? I'm not I'm not uh, I'm a communications guy. This sounds more than unfair. Yeah. So so NEPA is is the big elephant in the room of environmental regulation. It's it's the statute. That's the National Environmental Policy, Policy Act. I believe I got the acronym right. Um, passed in 1970 um, originally, and in in the abstract. The, the statute as written doesn't seem all that wrong. It, it essentially says if you're going to un- do a, a major federal undertaking or the federal government's going to approve of a ma- major undertaking that may have some impact on the environment, the government has to take a hard look and see if there are other ways that they can mitigate that damage. Like, would it be too bad? Um, so they, they can't do it at all. But there needs to be some sort of analysis. And I think most people um, probably will agree on some level of that. There, there are some crazy libertarians like me who want to burn it all down. But I think most of us can probably agree that that's not patently unreasonable. Uh, the idea that if the government's going to be tearing up a bunch of forest land, they need to be able to show what the impact is and what they're doing to mitigate. That makes sense. The problem is you get this kind of endless review, this endless moving of the goalposts that, that Kelly described is this process of where, cause like it, the, the statutes written theoretically are supposed to protect explicitly against this type of thing. The, the administrative procedure act was created b- way back in the 1930s explicitly as a reaction to FDR's overreach. And it was written to be like Congress saying we have specific rules about how the agencies do their business. And If everyone was following the rules under what NEPA says, under what the the APA says, Solnex would have gotten their lease, uh, would have been drilling 20, 30 years ago. Um, So it's not always necessarily the laws on the books so much as how the administrations and the agencies tend to enforce them um, and the sort of collusive relationships that you often often get between the activists and the uh, the bureaucrats reviewing the applications. Now, this collusive relationship, I, Katie, we were talking about this before we kind of got this webinar started. How does this collusive relationship between activist groups and 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 the government how do, how does this play out? What what exactly are they doing? Yeah, so it's been it's been interesting to watch under kind of the new administration, um, who's been tasked with defending a lot of the prior administrations decisions. And so what we're seeing as states is these are these environmental groups coming in saying, wait a second, you didn't do enough review. You didn't cross the T's and dot the I's exactly as we think you should under this, you know, NEPA statute that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And then you have the federal government saying, you know, okay, yeah, you're right. We shouldn't have done that. And, and kind of entering into these agreements with the environmental groups to basically ratchet up the review process. Um, and so our job as states and, and other organizations, um, different coalitions of uh, businesses and other groups have, have been intervening in these cases to basically defend the government's prior actions and say, no, the government did sufficient review. Um, the government, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, coal leases, these these pipelines that were approved, they were done so properly, and you you dotted the I's and crossed the T's. Let's move on. And so, um, what these environmental groups are doing, as we kind of talked about, is trying to weaponize this um, delay and this um, bureaucratic review 
such that they can just push it out long enough for the new administration to come in and, and kind of change change the rules. Um, and I guess I'd, I, I'd point out one case, I'd highlight one case that we've been working on um, that what Kelly was saying really resonated. Um, the Obama, Under the Obama administration, there was the coal moratorium. The Trump administration came in and repealed that, um, the coal moratorium. And so environmental groups sued and said, um, there had to be some sort of review. This is, is going to have a huge impact on the environment. And so um, the court then said, all right, federal government agency, you need to go back and you need to review um, you know, whether or not repealing the coal moratorium is going to have a, an environmental effect. Government does that, agency does that, comes back a couple of years later, says, look, we did it. And what do you know? Um, it's everything's good to go. Let's repeal the, the coal moratorium. Then the environmental groups come in and say, well, wait a second, you did the review, but you didn't do it exactly how we wanted you to. And you didn't do all these extra things like consider carbon emissions and greenhouse gases and um, all these extra things. And so we're, you know, four years later, still litigating this case um, because it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth. And again, this idea of just moving the goalposts and moving the rules, um, it's, it's frustrating to see. And um, when when the federal government isn't willing to kind of stand up and say this is wrong. It's almost like the these. Case. Yeah, it's almost like these activists have like uh, like a list of things that they can they can sue on and they don't sue all at once. They like keep it one at a time to keep you just indefinitely like that. OK, this this is harassment in any other context here. Right. You know, if, if I if I want to build a, a property here in, in my local town and my, you know, my zoning board says, yeah, you can do this. And then I go to city council and they say, actually, no, you can't, even though you did everything right because, you know, of some political agenda that, that there would be grounds to say that that is totally uh, illegitimate. OK, we're, we said NEPA is, is at fault here. The this Administrative Procedure Act here, the Sioux, what do you call it, sue and settle? Is that, is that what this is? The sue and settle. That This is what's at fault. How, how, how do you fix this? How, how do you how do you change this? No, I, I think there's a happy story here for the Longwells, but is this no well, talk to me here what's going on we, we did not see any movement until the mountain states got involved and basically it's david and goliath i mean we didn't have the financial resources to fight the federal government with a private lawyer okay and so they started getting traction and it we had we had a, a judge a, a senior status judge who um very, very, very well respected at DC. And so he ruled in favor of us at the district court. It went up to the to the appellate court. They basically what he said in the first go round was 30 years is too long. That's arbitrary and capricious. You can't do that. So the appellate court said, well, you really didn't give us the grounds of why you thought that. So it remanded it back. Um Mountain States wrote an amazing um, summary judgment, and that, along with um, Judge Leon's own research, he actually went outside of what the, what our motion was, um, came up with an incredible opinion that um, you think will be will go through the appellate court, but this is more than likely going to the Supreme Court. We're re- I mean, well, I think David's ready. I would like yeah, to. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm excited. So, but at least there's like a goal. There, there's like a there's a destination, a final end point here, right? Well, I mean, right, yeah, yeah. So it's, right, it's, right. it's in the sights, at least. So we have this amazing victory from uh, from from Judge Leon. Um, David, is this? Are the courts the only option here to 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 put this practice to rest, or is there a different reform possibility that that we can do? Because you no, know, I'm. I, I've got um, a Brian here on Facebook who's saying it's really bad watching people in progress getting held up because of too much government. Is this a too much government problem? Is this a court problem? What What is the issue that really that we need to fix? Yeah, like 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 most problems in this area, it, it's complicated and multifaceted, and it requires multiple different kind of things 
uh, multiple different approaches. So one way is kind of the, the litigation pathway that we take, um, which is you, you find sympathetic parties like the Longwell family, like Solonex, and you, you find the injustice and you, and you throw it out to the world and, and you, you rely on, on independent minded judges who are willing to look deep into the facts of these cases, willing to go behind the, the sort of the easy, quick answers where the government always wins. So you, you obviously need people willing to fight that fight, willing to say, okay, like I'll, I'll, I'll lose $10 million fighting over this $1 million case, if that's what it takes. Um, so you do need that litigation. You also need, uh, States like Montana, who help out a, a lot in this, um, like Katie was talking about, situations where really the only way to stop situations like sue and settle are for powerful actors like the states to get involved and say, hey, 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 no, this isn't okay. We're not going to allow you to do this. We're going to represent our citizens and say, um, if we're going to hold the federal government to account on this. We're not going to allow you to to use a, a court settlement to get away with regulating something without notice and comment, um, like they often like to do. And then you also need, uh, you need essentially Congress and the states to, to step up and do their jobs uh, of the legislating. Because really, to bring this back to what I was saying at the very top of the, of the program, a lot of this is happening in complete plain sight, and no one has any idea about it. So a lot of it is just people recognizing that these unelected uh, bureaucrats have all this power, realizing that they are impacted, that they may not be an oilman like Sidney Longwell. They not, may not be out there in the, the boonies in, in extractive industries or anything, but like this, this affects all of us. And I think a, a large part of that is just making people aware of that these problems exist. Katie, I have I have something specific for you. And before I before I ask it, you know, this this because really the suing and settling is kind of where we're we're here. And you know, Katie, I'm not I'm not gonna ask you to speak on behalf of, of the, the state of Montana, but I do want to ask you know, in, in your role, um you no, know, we obviously don't want to eliminate the possibility of activist groups, because you no, know, not all activist groups are are the same. We don't want to prohibit them from holding the federal government accountable when, you know, if, if they actually do fail their job, we want to have a, a, a legal recourse to force them to do their job. But there's also, you no know, overdoing it. There, there's this, this, this problem we're talking about. What, what, if, what do you think, or what have you seen happening in your state or across the country that can find this, 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 this balance here, right? Is there, is that a possibility? You know, I think I think so. I I do think that having multiple voices in these different lawsuits is really helpful um, because, you know, there are cases where I mean, there's several cases that were involved that the state of Montana is involved in where the federal government is defending their decision on the merits and saying, no, we complied with everything we were supposed to, you know, buzz off um, to the environmental groups. Um, that there are other cases where depending on the policy at issue, you know, they're, they're not doing that. And so by having the states, um, we have, like I mentioned, other coalitions of, um, you know, industry, industry players, um, all coming to the table and all filing briefs that are saying, here are our concerns and here's what we think is wrong or right with, you know, whatever decision. And so I, I mean, I think that it's been very productive to have kind of these multiple voices, um, participating. And, and I think that goes to David's point about, you know, be, being aware of what's happening, um, you know, getting getting involved in, in litigation and, you know, kind of the agency process, because, um, you know, like we co we comment a lot on proposed regulations and whatnot. And, and we just we get involved at the beginning, because the more pressure, you know, you're putting on the federal government, the more voices that are being, you know, participating in rate saying that this is a problem, or this is a good thing. Uh, you know, then I think there are we we can eliminate the risks of having you know just one party come in and say I'm upset about this and the federal government saying yeah we can see that we kind of agree and then settling and it going away um, you know because then now now the court has to listen to what the state of Montana the state of Wyoming um, North Dakota you know all these all these states um, are saying about issues you know specific to to their state. Um, so I, I don't I don't think that this is this is absolutely hopeless. I think that there's um, a lot that can be done. And I do think I agree with David that um, kind of raising the alarm bells and, and trying to make people aware is is very important because, as as Kelly mentioned, you know, you move the goalpost 
and on the little things. And then all of a sudden we're now in, in, talking about the big things, um, you know, and, and now the government feels empowered, the agencies feel empowered to, to um, do, do more and, and kind of slow down the process even more. Stand yeah, the- and, you, and you'll, oh, sorry, Kelly. I'll say the, the, the government accomplished most of what they wanted to in our case. Every other lease that was around us actually turned them back in. There was a tax benefit that was passed where, but being individuals, we couldn't really take advantage of it, but they literally turned their leases back in um, to take that benefit. But so we're the last man standing. I mean, we're the only ones that are, that are out there still fighting, fighting the good fight. Yeah. All right. So and I was just saying like, it just, it just really matters because you to participate and be aware because you'll see when there'll be some big regulation, there'll be 18,000 comments organized by the Center for Biological Diversity and Friends. Um, and then the the property rights uh, concerned citizens will, will put out 3,000. Um, so like, the, so the agency is looking at, they see a big enthusiasm gap. And they're like, okay, well, if we don't want to get our houses firebombed, we'll pick it this side. Um, and I, that's a bit hyperbolic, but I think that that's, that's the point is that it's, a lot of it is just showing um, that that you that you know and that you care is enough. So, um, well, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. No, there's kind of an optimistic. Uh, there, there's an outlet here, right? That you know, when you've got organizations like Mountain States who who come to bat for 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 for, for families and organizations like the Longwells, that that there is a, a recourse to go for. That when we have states like Montana who are taking the fight, to say no, you. Feds, you got to do what you promised you were going to do. That there is a path forward, and I, and I do like to see that. And you know, Victor on Facebook, he said, "So much time and money spent on a problem that doesn't exist." That you know, it is right. These are public tax dollars that are being spent on this litigation that just goes round and round. How, what a waste, right? Um, I do have a, a question here from uh, Susan uh, on our Q and A. So again, if y'all have questions or comments that you want to kind of get out there. Feel free to put it. I'll try and get to you. Um, uh, I happen to happen to take them. Susan asked, "Are the tribes considered environmental activists? What what's their status in being or standing? I suppose in being able to being able to sue." They're at- well, they're they're treated as far as the the laws concerned. Um, they, they're not the same as the, the environmental activists. The environmental activists are just the same as ordinary citizens. They're just organized. Um, the the tribes are. are rightfully in and of their own right sovereign nations so they they get their own access to it because they they rightfully have of uh a say in, in how lands that, that impact them are, are run um but i think the problem is again you see this kind of late 80s early 90s where um i think you see the 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 leadership of a lot of tribes ended up realizing that they could have a very fruitful relationship with the environmentalist organizations. And I I don't think it's necessarily, and I want to be clear that when I criticize the tribes, I'm, I'm almost exclusively criticizing kind of the tribal leadership who takes these activist stances. The the vast majority of tribal members are are ordinary citizens, like everybody else. They they don't have these crazy positions. Um, But I, but I think there is, there's been some level of kind of capture or, um, by the the activists of the tribes, I may have gone a little bit beyond the question there. No, no, I th- I think I think that more or le- more or less gets to like how how what how their uh what what their role is in, in the process. Um, so there's uh, this other thing I know, and I think Kelly briefly mentioned how that they went up um to have meetings, and I think you were referring to was the the the, you know, was the section 106 meetings, and that's the the counterpart to to NEPA, the environmental. Act is uh, the NHPA, which is the National Historical Preservation Act, um, which is the the primary way in which the the tribes participate, um, along with the and that's with the register of the keeper, the keeper of the registry of national sort places, and that's where the the tribes will generally get involved for kind of their their historical and cultural resources. Um, but they're also not the only ones that do that. There's also talk about kind of old Mormon camps and trails and stuff that get discussed here as well but david aren't we talking about like parks we're not talking about lands that the tribes own we're right yes yeah, so like that's important well, yeah this no, is this no, is not, not tribal not, land it's not yeah. tribal land yeah this is not tribal land this is not on the reservation this is not owned by them 
Um, yeah. So that I think, thank you, Kelly. That's, that's important to know. Yeah. Um, the, the, the tribe claims an interest in the mountain is a religious object, but they don't own the land. Right. Oh, so, so this really is kind of a, maybe not far fetched, but it certainly seems stretched to say that they have a, a negative impact here. I think that's, that, that's where you see kind of the, the bad faith interpretation of the, the statues that were never kind of intended for this Yeah. in that I think it'd be, you'd be hard pressed if you talk to a, a member of Congress in 1970 um, or, or when NHPA was, was passed um, who would say, yeah, I, I think an, an entire mountain can be declared a, a cultural artifact. That's, that's off limits to all development. I think that that's clearly outside of the original scope of what was intended. And I think that's that's just part of this kind of the 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 overreach, the slow kind of blobbing out, the one way ratchet of, of how this tends to operate. Right, right. Okay. Um, I have another question here from Diane. Um, just uh, what was the win? Um, you know, we we obviously you know we we have Judge Leon's uh, 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 order. You no, know, that that reinstates the lease that or that that reverses the cancellation. And we know it's going to get appealed probably all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, her, she had a, a specific question. Do the Longwells have an oil company that will begin drilling? Because I know a lot of our viewers are are concerned about you know, the, the ability to produce energy right now in a time where you know, it seems like every politician is against energy production, but we're having crisis in California. So, you know, Kella, is there is there a company that can start using the lease? Uh, we have... We are in talks with two companies right now. Um, I think, well, we have, this has been fits and starts with the different oil companies to their, in their defense, you know, we have entered into agreements back in the past 15 years until we actually know a timetable. Everybody's like, let's just watch how this plays out. I mean, unfortunately, it's not, not, we're not going to have a good decision and an end to all this probably in the next year. So and drilling season is also very limited few months with due to the, the cold weather. Yeah. Yeah. So, sure, sure. But but there there is a possibility that should the Supreme Court finally give you the go ahead that there is someone that, that can take use of this victory. Most definitely. Yes. All right. Well, that's excellent to hear. Um, we are gonna we are starting to come to uh the close of our our session. I want to let you all give some final thoughts, some some oddities that didn't quite fit anywhere here. So this is your time to shine. Uh, David, Katie, Kelly, if you got something to share, please share share it now before we before we hang up. Um, well, I'll, I'll start. Is uh, I don't think I, I quite got the chance to tell the another outrage about this whole next case is that we we mentioned how the the agency came back in. 2016 and for the first time saying that oh we think that the blm screwed up no, again not not that solonex or that sydney long will screwed up but the government screwed up and where they're going to blame put the the cost onto you um but it wasn't quite true that it had never come up before it had this issue with the the nepa compliance had come up before um, environmentalist organizations actually had brought this up in a protest for one of those four times the the permit was approved back in the late eighties, early nineties. This was actually brought up and the federal government explicitly rejected the argument on multiple occasions saying, Oh no, we hear you. Um, we, we hear your argument. Here's the, these seven or eight different cases explaining exactly why we perfectly complied with NEPA and there's no problem whatsoever. Please stop asking us about this. Um, and then it was again, one day there was just, they decided it was going to be something else and they flipped their switch. And so that's the big thing for me was just the, the, the utter hypocrisy of just flipping on a, on a, on a, on a dime like that. Is, is the, that, that, that they're not held to their own precedent. Yeah. The, 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 they had, they had not just not said anything. They had explicitly and repeatedly told Solonex that their lease was valid for, for decades before we, for, before we were So it wasn't just, a delay it was a it was a reversal and a, and a betrayal really oh man okay oh that's gee, yikes um katie do you have a another final oddity to share 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I would I would just say, um, you know, kind of what we were just talking about. This is it's incredibly frustrating to see how this process just hurts people who are trying to just do what what they think that they're supposed to be doing, you know, and, and going through this process. And um, I it's but it's also um, really encouraging to see um, these independent minded judges um, like Judge Leon and and groups like Mountain States, and then of course. Um, Kind of shout outs to states like Montana and, and other groups that are kind of stepping up to the plate and and trying to rein in um, what what we see happening. And so I think it's just very important that we all continue to, um, you know, keep our eye out for this type of um, abuse and um, behavior, whether it's, you know, the federal government, whether it's the en- environmental groups trying to weaponize um, these massive procedural statutes uh, against, um, you know, in- energy infrastructure. These are critical issues of our day. And um, so I'm on one hand discouraged uh, by, you know, some of the behaviors that we've seen in this litigation, um, as well as, you know, lit- litigation all across the country. But I'm also encouraged by, um, you know, groups like Mountain States, um, groups like um, the industry people that intervene in our cases, um, you know, stepping up and, and trying to trying to do the right thing and, and really rein in the government. Wonderful. Um, Kelly, you've got the, the last word here. Um, I just want- I yeah. wanted to say thank you to Mountain States and to Montana. I mean, y'all, Montana hasn't intervened in our case, but they have been watching it very closely. Yeah, yeah right. Um, it's just, I would say, please stay informed. You know, there's so much going on out there that you don't realize. And having having a platform like this just to get the the word out that, no, it's not all about the environmentalists, making sure that the, that the country's safe. I mean, it's it's really... It matters. So please stay informed. Okay. Um, I think that's it for us, everyone. Uh, Just to kind of wrap up, thank you all for joining us on this episode of So Neighbor Asked. Thank you both to Katie and Kelly for being our very special guests. Um, I I appreciate you coming and giving us the good news and the bad news sometimes. Uh, For everyone out there, within about a week, we will have this webinar Uh, edited and uploaded to YouTube for your future viewing and sharing. Uh, In the meantime, you can be sure to keep up to date with our important work, such as the Solnex case, at our website at mslegal.org. And you can follow us at Twitter at MSLF, Instagram at Mountain States Legal, or you can find us on Facebook. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you all next month. Have a happy Halloween, by the way, and we don't see you then.